who has trained printers at workshops in the United States and abroad. He lectures and teaches workshops regularly on art, printmaking, collecting, and the business of art. Saunders has worked as a collaborating master printer with hundreds of artists and has produced several thousand works, many of which are contained in prominent public collections. He is also the author of Prints and Their Makers, a definitive publication on contemporary collaborative printmaking published by Princeton Architectural Press and distributed by Chronicle Books. So please join me in a warm and virtual welcome for Phil Saunders. Thank you. Thank you, that was very kind. <laughs> and um, I just wanna to to give you a little bit of context of where we are. Um, I'm in residence at the Hogan Studio. I set up a print shop in the studio of uh, Kevin Hogan here in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, which is just uh, familiar with Black Mountain College um, and its history. That was just a few minutes outside of town from where we are right now. So I'm in uh, the historic area of Asheville right now. So what's behind me is a print shop that's been set up that's run. What you're looking at is a lithography press and an etching press right there, which I have actually set up to do relief prints. And so a little bit before we get going, I'll, I'll give you, I'll do a screen share with you guys and give you a uh, quick look inside the book so you get a little bit of a context. And I'll talk a little bit about the relationship between artists and printers and that collaborative, collaborative process for just a few moments. And then I'll show you some things that are in process in the studio um, with different artists. And we'll go ahead and I'll pull up uh, uh, Lynn Meyer's work that I have in process. So you guys will get to see it in its states and how that process is working right now. And we can open it up for conversation with the artists like Caitlin Teal Price is here and um, as well as Lynn. So that way you guys can get a little bit of a view and not just what it's like for us to work together, but also it's kind of the changing nature of working with one another in pandemic times, which is more of this type of interaction than uh, most of us are used to. So I'll uh, share the screen with you right now and show you a few, um, different things. And there we go. And see how she loads. Back that up a minute, start on the first slide. And uh, <laughs> I'm happy to take questions whenever. So whoever is monitoring the chat, just feel free to kind of look at them and if it seems appropriate, um, go ahead and shoot them out. It doesn't have to be just me talking to you guys. So this is the cover of the book. It's coming out um, here in just a few days. It's really close. So the pre-orders are going out uh, the beginning of next week. So if you've pre-ordered one, thank you very much and start checking the mail. We'll see how long it takes to get to you at the post office, but um, it should hopefully get there um, in good order. And what I wanted to talk about is a little bit of what's inside the book. And for me, the, the book is designed for not just for artists or printmakers, but also for collectors or people who are interested in art and want to really understand more about why artists make work, especially in the medium of print. And one of the things that I really dive into here is what an artist gets as far as the feedback from the process. And this is a classic representation of Durer's work, um, his famous Adam and Eve engraving. And what you see at the top is this, what's called a state proof, which, which is a when a plate is in process, but it's not complete and you pull an impression or you print it to paper so that you can see where you're at. And the wonderful thing about this for artists is that it provides a feedback that you wouldn't normally get through your creative process um, because you would say be working and you're looking at it as it is right now if you're working on a painting and you keep moving forward but you don't get to see exactly what it looked like in an earlier state to have that to reference or to go back and look at. But in printmaking, we have these printed records. So there's no subjectivity of memory. And for a lot of artists, this is really wonderful because um, they get to see their creative process opened and revealed. So a lot of what the book does is balance between the relationship of how between an artist and a printer and how that collaboration goes and how their skill sets merge with one another. I always say that what we're looking for as collaborating printers is we're looking for a, a situation that's a one plus one equals three, meaning the artists and their mastery with the printers and their mastery combined together create something that's greater than what they could either do um, alone. It's we're greater than the sum of our parts. And so I go into depth about that process and I, I really talk and focus on um, 
Robert Blackburn features heavily throughout. I used to be the director of the Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop and the COO of the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts. And one of my tasks was charged with the legacy, helping to promote the legacy of Robert Blackburn, African-American printers created um, a really the concept of collaborative printing as we know it today is really the foundation of that with his workshop in 1948. And this image here of uh, Bob Blackburn and Bob Rauschenberg working together um, shortly after they printed the famous print accident, the photograph is taken by Hans Naumann because the first time this image has been in print. Um, by and large, uh, many artists of color have been and women have been left out of the canon and part of this book is to really help include a wider diversity of voices um, as far as the print canon is concerned. It's also a, a press side view, much of what we're going to be doing today, where you guys get to kind of come into the print shop and see what we're working on and see how things go. I try to put you press side in the book as well. And this is a project that was done between James Sienna and Katia Santabanez um, with May Shore at Shore Publishing up in Tuxedo, New York. And this is a collaborative process and I kind of explain it all and you get to see how it's put together and these are the final images. I also really focus on how an artist has to think in order to put work in a process and how they have to retrain themselves to see because printmaking, it's taking your normal process apart into pieces and then putting it back together again. And so I go over that and show examples of how, like these are all the layers of each drawing of the 12 layers it took to create the lithograph you just saw. And so you get snippets of that, you get some process stuff. So you get to see how the artists are working and how processes are come together. Uh, that was an image of working on a Will Cotton print. This is Chikai Booker working um on a Shinkoi monotype at the Robert Blackburn printmaking workshop and I also try to create a little bit of a historical context so when you're looking at the images so like in this case this is really encapsulating the beginning of screen print and it's you know the history is written there as well but it's also to visually encapsulate it in ways that are more holistic quite often someone like sister Corita Kent would be relegated to a whole different section it wouldn't be she wouldn't necessarily be discussed in the same conversation as Andy Warhol though Andy Warhol's early screen prints are the reason she started doing screen print and she really took screen print in a very different direction and as far as not just for artwork and her own personal artwork but how you could use it for community benefit and then we look down at the Raymond Pettibone and SST records and how it was used for the punk rock movement and anti-nuke movement so it's really trying to tell a more holistic picture rather than always pulling everything apart so from a historic perspective, you really can see um, how things evolved and why. And then showing how it updates the current times. This is a project by Hank Willis Thomas, uh, where he used a reflective graphic screen printing material, which means you can't actually see the image. So what you're looking at on the right is the way the image looks until you put your cell phone up to it. And the light on your cell phone camera will, will cut through that film that's printed over it to allow the image to come through. And the image that's here is you know, the famous image of Charles Chambry. Um, uh, from 1963 that was on the Life magazine cover that Andy Warhol also used for one of his images. But what he's really talking about here is the nature of witness and participation. And so if you have to hold up your phone and you turn the camera on in order to see the image, you have a choice in whether or not you document you know, how you participate and what you witness. And so he really started with his work some really great conversations about um, participation and the responsibility and culpability. And um, he often describes himself as a um, cultural anthropologist as much as he does as, as an artist. So there's works like this that are detailed throughout the book as well. Um, and then there's wonderful image galleries which really show just how uh, the process in the hands of an artist becomes the artist's work. So these two are both lithographs. We got a Lynn Myers on the right and a Susan Hall on the left. They're both lithographs using the exact same process but for wildly different results to really demonstrate how printmaking is driven by the artist. Its, it's result is based on what the artist is looking for. You know, in this case, these are two different monotypes, Eddie Martinez and Mel Bachner, and Stanford Biggers and Chitra Ganesh working in a multiple processes. So some of them involve screen print with woodcut or digital or chine collet. And so a lot of times artists are working in a wide variety of areas. So the book in and of itself is broken out into different categories, relief printing, intaglio, photogravure, sheet play, lithography, screen print, monotype, and multi-process printing. So that way you get each in its own kind of world, but there's a thread that runs through all of them and that's way, the way it's organized. And so some of the things I like to show are, are examples like this. These are both uh, aquatints etchings or intaglio prints. Um, one is a uh, cat printer gas and the other one's uh, Mama Anderson. And Mama Anderson print was done at Crown Point Press and the cat printer gas was done at, um, a Stony Road Press in Dublin. And so here you have artists who are working with the exact same materials, 
you know, using the same equipment, producing wildly different results. And these are artists from different parts of the world. So Mama Anderson's from Sweden. She was working in San Francisco. Kat Pendergast is in Dublin. So for me, it was really important to any organization of this book to really show just how global it is as a process and to include the widest diversity of voices possible, as well as, as um, perspectives of different printers. So there's 33 different publishers represented. There's more than 100 contemporary artists. 160 plus full page images or reproductions of work. So you can really see the work. So my hope with this is that you walk away and what it makes you want to do is just go see more prints, either visit institutions um, or really um, spend time diving into what you have locally accessible or seeking out printers and publishers and artists to really spend that time and that intimate nature with the work. So we'll get back to this one later. I'm gonna stop the screen share and really show you guys now a little bit of print shop. So it'll be a little bit of slightly awkward. I try to have as steady a camera as I could to show you guys around, get you closer to things here in the studio. But being at the print shop, it's not a luxurious space kind of situation. We don't have, we use every square inch that we can for production. So I'll wheel you around as best I can. I'll get you over here to the litho press first. Let me tip it down. So this litho press, on it currently has a small litho stone. So lithography was traditionally done, it was invented in 1798 by Alois Senefelder for the purpose of being able to reproduce images and text at equitable quality in a more efficient manner. And so he came up with this process of drawing on stones. And we still use this process today. Very little has changed since uh, 1798 with the way in which I approach doing this. So you have a drawing on a stone, um, that was done with a grease pencil. It's processed chemically and images washed away and then printed and impression after impression after impression. And so in a studio, we often switch between plates as well as stones. But in this case, you know, I just printed this one yesterday and I'll show you the print that came off of it, which is not in its final state, but it's close. And this is a print. So I have special limited editions going, but this is a print actually of mine that I drew and has some watercolor that's gonna get added to it. So if someone buys the author edition, this is the first time anyone's getting to see what it looks like. Um, but and it's, you know, we can pull as many impressions as we need to off this. Um, but in the art world, we generally are pulling more limited impressions because we're more interested in making more work versus necessarily more of the same. Coming over this way. So at any given time I've got anywhere from three to 10 projects in process at the same time. And the reason there's so many is because of the artist's time and studio time in order to produce proofs and turn things around for people, let them have time with them, um, make decisions on when things need to be completed uh, relative to deadlines and things. So right now I've got, I think it's eight prints in the works and a few of them are just finishing up. So over here on the etching press, um, I'm going to pull out a project that I'm working on with Caitlin Teal Price. And this is what you're going to see is the early state of this. So, because we are uh, in process, Caitlin is actually finishing the drawings right now. So, what you're getting to see, you normally don't get to see, which is all of the steps that we think about when we're discussing, my, me and myself and Caitlin talking about her work, and we're trying to find the place that it needs to be. And so what you're looking at are is two plate intaglios, or photogravure base plate with a under plate that has a tone or a color to it. So off on the left here, this is the photogravure printed in a transparent black to try to increase the tone and maybe the moodiness of this kind of light flare. And then what you have here is with it having a red incorporated underneath that. So it's a two plate print. And over here, having a yellow with also some of that ink removed away to kind of create a greater depth within that flare of light. And so a lot of people would say, wow, that's beautiful right now, it's done. But that's not actually where we're stopping. And this is where it gets even more interesting. Uh, she's currently drawing some layers of screen print to go on top of this. And so right now we're looking at, I think it's four colors uh, that she's drawing. And it, when we say colors, meaning variations of whites. And she has this beautiful line work that she's been working on and how she's been evolving her practice in her studio as an artist working back into her photographs um, because she is no, you know, widely known as a photographer. And so these, it's kind of a new direction. And one of the things that makes me excited about working with an artist like Caitlin at a point like this in her career 
when she's really taking some creative leaps and she's really pushing her work in a new direction is I get to be part of that process. You know, so for a lot of people, it's, um, it's hard to make changes and you're not, you want to see more things. And so for us as printers, what we really get is this kind of special view and a special role to be a participant in that and to maybe help. And so for me, that's one of the great things about being a collaborating printer is getting to see the world through the eyes of the artists that you work with. And so I'm really excited to see, you know, how, what comes back. She sent me some mock-ups. She's working on the drawings right now and I'll get the drawings here in the mail um, fairly soon. And then I'll make the screens and I'll go ahead and print on top of the proofs for her. And then they'll go back to her and there'll be some Zoom or FaceTime conversations like this. And so traditionally, non-pandemic uh, times, the artist would be present in the studio when all this production is going on. And there's a really a lot of wonderful things that happen that way. And, but it's a very intense kind of situation where you're trying to get as much done in a single day as possible. What I found in a slight change like this is it's giving people a little bit more time to think about things than they would normally have when you're just press side. So it's a change in, of how we're looking at it. And I feel like it's a new chapter that'll be written you know, a decade or two from now because I see a lot more of this um, will persist over time, I think, this way of working. And I think Caitlin's here. And I don't know if she has anything she'd like to add or jump in on this right now, but now would be a, a good time if she wants to say a few words about the print that we have in process. I think she's still here. Do you, 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 can if you, want. you don't have to, I don't need to put you on a spot, <laughs> but I am, I am showing some stuff we're working on. And personally, I'm very excited to get your drawings. Um, and to yeah, I'm, I, I am too. I'm actually working on them right now. <laughs> there so, <you> go. yeah. <laughs> so this is the first time I've done this type of work, as you mentioned, and I'm, I'm really excited to kind of figure it out. Um, and, you know, work with the layers and I'm, I'm, it's really nice to see them here. Um, yeah. Right. Cause I mean, for, I think one of the, the hard parts, I think for a lot of people is they see these states and they think, wow, that could be done. It's so beautiful. And, but you know, there's, there's this other drive and desire that you have to take the work in another direction and a little bit further. And I think that's one of the fun parts about printmaking is we can do a lot of testing. It's not like you have to make 20 pieces, we can just change the color of the inks and using the same stuff and you can see your results a lot faster. That's one of the things I love about printmaking for artists, what we can do as collaborating printers is, is we can put that forward for you guys to go, you can see more faster and help you get to that place where you're trying to push a little bit faster and then to see what the results are when you go back to your regular studio practice. So Absolutely. I'm to see where it goes. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, that, that process is, is, is really exciting for me too. Um, the way I usually work on, on photographs is with an exacto blade into the work. So I really only have one chance to do it and it's really laborious. So this is a really fun process for me because you can change it in so many ways without it being permanent. And so working with you is really exciting in order to see kind of all of the different variations that you can, you could have with the same, with the same plate. Um, and the, the screen prints. Right, because we can just even change the order of the way we layer the screen print. And yeah. Slight variations in color, like we can make something all white, slightly pink or slightly blue to make them move around. And I think that's a lot of the fun part about it too. It's just, um, Jasper Johns was famous for saying, I can draw in black thinking I'm gonna make it blue. And then I can see it in green, I can see it in red, and then I can make it blue again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so and I think that really encapsulates the process. Yeah quite well you know so you know for me that's what was a fun part of doing the proofing is you know we had you know conversations and sent some visual sketches back and forth and then it was really nice to be able to you know spend a little bit of that time with those plates to try to help kind of bring out what you were looking for in those images and then you know send them back to you because I know sometimes it can be a little nerve-wracking for an artist to get the results because you have a picture in your mind and then there's this thing that exists and then it's how you reacquaint yourself with the work through mm -hmm. that process yeah yeah and also just the variations in the color and the, and in the in the prints themselves and how how differently it registers in red as it does in yellow and to have that flexibility to sort of move from one color to the next is um very cool right and i mean and for those of you at home the only thing that's different on those is the under color so the way the black is printed is the same on all three. 
which is kind of crazy because the way you see the image changes so dramatically. And it just has to do with how those colors drop into one another. And it's not actually a true black, it's a black that has um, a slight bit of violet in it so that it um, settles in and creates a wider range of color feeling and things like that. So those are things that Kate and I talked about before we start printing. And there's a lot of discussion that goes into things. I think the thing that most people don't understand about the collaborative print process is how much talking has to happen before any work can happen. And when they see the workload then they kind of get a better understanding of that there's a lot that happens in this process to get down to that distilled image. So yeah, I'm excited to get those films and start printing yeah. for you. Me too. Um, are there any questions at this point? Because otherwise I, I can there are, there are two folks who ask the same question about what type of ink you're using for this particular project and paper. Um, great question. So I'm, uh, paper is Hanamule Copper Plate and it's the uh, bright white and I'm using the bright white in order to get the most punch out of the color um, in there so that way it's not um, being altered slightly. Um, as far as the inks, I'm using a variety of inks. I'm using lithography inks as well as intaglio inks and, and there's reasons for both of those. Um, lithography inks have a higher pigment density that, because they're intended to be printed in super thin layers but also have maximum uh, intensity of color. So I'll often use those when I'm working with color and intaglio in, in order to get the most out of that. So the color is all lithographic ink and the black is all um, intaglio ink. And so I'm using Portland black. It's made by Gamblin for the etching ink and I'm using different. Um, so there's a pheasant brown, which is actually a violet earth tone that's added to that black. And that's actually lithographic ink um, to give it this warmth to really let it drop in and make it feel um, like you can touch it you know, versus it being like a really cold, stark black. So it, it softens it and there's transparency added to all these colors too, so they can drop into one another and you get a greater depth of space. So hopefully that answers it. I can go even more nerdy on it for you guys. Well, you there, <laughs> the question did continue. Um, are you using Hanco, Hancock's ink? The lithographic ink is, um, uh, see I have some Hanshi. Uh, the old Hanshi, and I have some Hanko. Um, being I've been printing for a quarter century now, it's uh, I have a wide variety of older inks that I kind of save. Um, so I'm using Gamblin inks for the intaglio ink. I'm using Charbonnel for the transparency for the intaglio. I'm using Hanko and Hanshi for the litho inks. So the Hanshi, the pheasant brown, that was a Hanshi ink, um, which you have to special order these days because company shifts and stuff. But I still have a pretty good stock of that stuff. So. I try to keep a wide variety of really specific um, pigment ranges so that I can mix just about any color for an artist possible. Hopefully that answered the question. And there are other modifiers. So like I, mean, I use tack reducer when I'm printing um, with litho ink for Antalya. I use Gamblin's tack reducer. So that way it's, uh, cause there's a difference in the way the inks are made. So litho ink is made to be sticky, to be rolled, to stay where you put it. And etching ink or intaglio ink is made to be slippery so you can wipe it off the surface of the plate easier. Um, so the litho ink being so sticky, it makes it hard to wipe. So whenever I add that to an intaglio ink, I use a tack reducer to kind of eliminate that quality of its stickiness to make it easier to wipe. Another question, this one from Jack, please mention the title of your book again and where it is available. Prints and their makers, I've got a copy. I've got a little pile, it just arrived. Um, and that comes out uh, officially released October 27th. That's when places like Amazon will start shipping it. Um, you can buy it on Amazon. I would prefer you not. I prefer <laughs> you buy it through a different um, person if you can. You can buy it from my own personal website, which is just philsandersprintmaking.com. And I've got signed copies on there and as well as this, what's called the author's edition, which comes with a print of mine in it. And it's also the, uh, which is a nice time to talk about this one. There's the artist edition. One of the artists in the book, Glenn Baldridge, and I did this screen print, which I have a slide of it later too, uh, which has, if you can see that shininess, there's some pretty amazing silver foil on there. Um, so this is a screen print he did. And so there's, that was a separate, it's called an artist edition of the book you can get as well. Both of those through the through my website, uh, philsandersprintmaking.com. It's also ways to contact me and see other videos that I've done for, you know, I do a lot of lectures out of museums. Um, archives and, coll and collections for collecting groups and things like that. We pull work and we talk about the historical context or stories and things like that about how these prints were made or um, as well as you know, their relevance to today based on the past and things like that. So yeah, thanks for asking. 
So now, if, if there's no more questions right now, now would be a good time to transition to the project I'm working on with Lynn, Lynn Myers. So what I'll do is, hey, I see Lynn's over there. <laughs> I see, yeah. made it to your studio. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, here, I'll do a screen share. And so one of the things I wanted to do was give you guys a little bit of context about Lynn's work if you're not familiar with her work. Um, some of you may have seen the site-specific wall drawing piece that she did it for the Hirschhorn. So I like, like to start kind of with the big stuff and then work in. Um, so to give you a little bit of context, because the work that we're doing right now that she and I are collaborating on in the studio right now, um, on some levels, if you just saw it, you might think it's really different. But if we put it in appropriate context, you can really see the thread of how it just is a, another aspect of her working practice. And so I'd like to really show you that. So she's, Lynn's known for her site-specific wall drawings. And these are ephemeral or temporal pieces. I mean, they're up for hopefully about the period of a year, but sometimes a little less or a little more. And then they're gone. And so they live on and only in documentation. And so it's a major aspect of her work in a way that she engages with her audience. But it also informs her, her, her more traditional painting practice. And these are you know pieces that are I would don't want to say intimate in scale, but far more intimate relative to the giant site-specific works. But these these pieces they all relate to one another, and how she's looking to, you know, either collaborate with the architecture of the world or collaborate with society. And we, she and I talk a lot about this process of collaboration that comes through in her work, and how um, she really responds to the themes and things going on in the day uh, of today, like in our time socially, and how that ends up influencing her work as well as with the site-specific pieces how you interact with that space and how that space then becomes a part of the way in which you view yourself within it and view the work. So for us, we have a lot of conversations about a lot of the minor details and how they affect you either physically or psychologically. And it's really been a wonderful part of the conversational process. So this is a super new one um, of Lynn's that she sent me an image of. Um, we, we spend a lot of time communicating via text message and um, getting images back and forth, which is really helpful. And this is a piece you guys may not have been familiar with, but I thought was particularly relevant to the body of work we're working on now. Um, and, and it's uh, kind of its tension and its negative and positive space qualities and its ability to kind of make you feel like something is moving or doing something different than you may expect. And it's a particularly nice painting. And so Lynn has this also this practice that gets even goes even smaller and, you know, a drawing practice where she deals with found graph papers or scientific papers and, and then incorporates pattern work and, and balance and sometimes in opposition and sometimes in balance with. And there's this nice response here. And so what's interesting about this is, you know, she's working with something that exists already, this graph paper, and then she's responding to it, which is very much like her working on a large site specific piece. She's, she has a building, she has walls, she has the lighting that she has to deal with and respond to that and to have her work incorporate with it. So there's a really nice mirroring of her drawing practice when it comes to a small scale you know, 10 by eight inch drawing and as well as a large format work. You know, and so, but she has, you know, different ways that she approaches it. And this is more kind of thinking about it more like her paintings. And so Lynn and I have recently worked on some prints together down at Flying Horse Editions in Orlando, Florida. And these were some photo reviewer with uh, direct reviewer with sugar lip and spit bite and you know, the kind of crazy prints. And these are two versions of that um, that we did down there um, with Steve Fournier who's one of the printers involved in this project as well. And you know, so this process, she and I really got to know one another pretty well. And so as she started going into a new body of work, you know, this is, you know, the pandemic happens and everybody's on quarantine, which in some ways feels like a little bit of a house arrest in a lot of ways. And, um, Lynn's had this book, uh, Turner and Ruskin, it was in it from 1900, is the first edition that she's carried around with her for over 30 years. And so she grabbed some things from her studio and came back and was trying to figure out, you know, the work she wanted to make while in quarantine. And so what happened was is she started approaching the text of the book almost in the same way that she would approach the way she looks at a museum wall saying, what is here and what do I respond to and how do I want to work with that? And she started doing these, what we were referring to as text reduction pieces. So she would eliminate all of the text down to a, just a very small amount. And if you, if, I'll read what it says. If you can't see it, it says, um, yes, I miss the most. You, or I sorry, you, I miss the most. Yeah. I can't even read. I mean, I my reading glasses on. <laughs> and so, and you know, and so she started working on pieces like this, which you know was bouncing back to drawing practice and starting to see 
how this negative space was really affecting her visually and what she wanted to think about, not just what remained, but also what was removed and what that meant. And thinking about the words creating a visual image as well as the, the object itself being a separate visual image and how these two things work in consort with one another. And so, um, you know, when you think about these as base images, she kept pushing them in different directions. And so this is where the project that we're working on kind of began. Is from these drawings and these text reductions because when we talked about the project she would like to do I, you know we started off with we could do things that we're more familiar with that we have been doing like the you know direct reviewer work and things like that or we could take this into a new direction and i suggested the possibility of working in woodcut and i asked her about that and since she didn't have a history with woodcut we felt this would be a really great place to dive into a, a new direction or a new body of more intimate scale works and that is what leads us to where we're at right now and so what we've got on the press, I set up my etching press for printing woodcuts. So we've got some rails here. And one thing I wanted to show you guys this is for the print geeks out there. So we're working on oak veneered plywood. We, we selected oak really for its grain, that it has a tightness to a grain, but there's also pattern and physicality to it. Um, and so we're using half inch plywood. And I've got a registration system up here at the top, which has pins punched into it. And everything is such that uh, I can easily pass it all through the press and perfect register. So, but being that we're not 100% certain what Lynn's looking for, because it's a new body of work and we need to, she needs to see a lot of stuff. You know, it's like any artist would. Um, we decided to approach it in a slightly different direction. We're not actually cutting the blocks of wood, we're actually using stencils. So this block, you can see how it's just got a lot of ink kind of on it. What we printed, so far is this. And so I'm gonna move it close to the camera so you can see that grain. It has this beautiful wood grain to it. And so it's printing, we're using a stencil to get a very nice crisp image. And what we've actually created is the negative of that piece of paper from the Turner Investing Book. So that's the size of it right there. So we're starting to do is activate the space around to create the environment for things to live within. And what we're gonna print on top of it right now, I'll print for you is actually the cutout, it's like the, the shape of that cutout, right? So it doesn't have the text though. So we're really dealing with that negative space in those voids and seeing how we can activate that as an image. So this is that block printed in black, but we're gonna actually print it in a different color. We're gonna print it in gray. And I'll ink that block up for you right now. So for the print geeks in anticipation of the question, it's really nice that there are enough of you to ask those questions on this call. Um, I'm using a combination of block printing ink as well as lithographic ink for very similar reasons as I've stated before. And um, modifiers to that. So I'm modifying this to roll and the thinnest amount of ink possible. So a lot of times for relief printing, I use uh, lithographic ink as well because it has a higher pigmentation and I can put a thinner amount of ink, which means I can print the grain more open. I've also added a little bit of litho varnish to this um, as well as a little bit of that's well, which is grease. And so I'm trying to control the tack or the body of the ink separate from the grease because the grease is what sticks your ink to paper and the tack is what holds its detail in place. And so then there's also some dryers in that ink as well. And so I'm extending my little slab here to get just the right amount of ink on that roller. And if you can see, what I have as far as the block is concerned is I've just taped off a square. And what I'm gonna do is print within that zone or ink within that zone. And we're gonna add a stencil on top of that to get the exact thing she's looking for. When it comes time to addition this, I'll actually cut the block. Um, and but right now we're trying to figure out exact positioning and that balance and the tension that one's going for. Maybe she would like something to be a little bigger, or a little smaller, or a different type of edge. And so what this is allowing us to do is play around with it a little bit more, have a little bit more freedom um, than we might if we were already committing ourselves to having to cut a block in a very specific way. So the modifiers, some of the reason for the modifiers that I use as well is it allows me to roll a very even 
uh, ink film with a very small roller. So what I'm doing is not just only watching the block and looking for it, but I'm also uh, listening to how it grabs or the sound of it. And hopefully you can hear it rolling. So you can hear it has a nice evenness everywhere I'm rolling sounds the same. And I can also see that I'm not tracking any roller marks or things like that. So at this point, that is properly inked. And I will remove my tape borders. And this is just really to keep things neater and cleaner. Because I'm using a stencil, I don't necessarily have to have this on there, but it just keeps everything a little bit cleaner. So now I've cut a stencil, you can see, of the shape that we're going for. Put it on those little registration pens, gently lay it in. Now I can add the sheet that has the first layer on it, which the ink was printed yesterday and this is nice and dry now. So I can print this next layer without worrying about transferring anything off or setting off. And then another kind of print geek thing. So you have a lot of choices when you're doing a relief print on if you want the grain embossed or if you want a little bit flatter impression. And in this case, we're using a chipboard to get a little bit flatter, smoother impression rather than driving with a felt down into the press or the paper down into the block of the press. So we set this up here. And I will bring it around for everybody to see it, including Lynn. <laughs> so. So now, well, we're, we're starting to get different relationships that occur, but you can really see where the work started and the ideas and how our drawings and how her site specific work and all these things kind of come together into this, what we would call a new direction, but to me, it just seems more like a logical growth or extension of the way that she, Lynn has always worked. So, I don't know, Lynn looks very contemplative. Um. <laughs> Well, I, um, I'm sitting here in the studio and I have, um, well, first of all, we should point out that the paper will be torn down to the top edge of that. Yeah. So, um, well, what kind so, of like that? <laughs> so, yeah. So, so that people understand that it's like a full bleed, yep. um, around the edges. Um, I'm in the studio and I have the proofs that you sent me that we got to this place from, um, so, I don't know if you want me to sh flip through those really quick so sure. people can see the different. Okay, um, let me see if, how I flip this around here. Oh, there we go. Okay, um, so these are just many iterations of um, the same ideas, trying to kind of um, narrow down what direction we're going in. So Phil sent these to me. Um, and then I worked on them with colored pencil to kind of um, get a better sense of what I wanted to pull out, um, you know, what elements I wanted to um, magnify. Um, this one's a slightly different um, image from a different text reduction piece. Um, and we should also mention that the, um, the final print will have the text that was originally on the page. So this is the piece that you're basically working towards right now. Um, the, the final print will have the text 
that was originally on the, the page of the Turner and Ruskin book um, stamped at the bottom. So at the bottom of this print, it will say, you, I miss the most. Um, and these works, um, I think Phil, you may have mentioned this, but um, the text reduction works um, are all um, new starting with the quarantine with the pandemic. So they relate very directly to the period that we're all living through right now. So there you go. Yeah, just to give you guys a little bit of background too on the process. So Lynn and I spent a lot of time talking about um, what these pieces mean for her and what she was seeing in them, these text reductions. And that really gave us the, the place to start with working, how to use them as a springboard for making another body of work. You know, so that's, that's why we're starting in the way we are, but we have really no idea where they're actually gonna end, but it's just a place to start. Phil, there are a few questions. Can I pose them now? Sure, now's a great time. Okay, uh, from Judy Mensch, she would like to know, what is the black under the gray rolled color? Black. What is the black under the- Oh, gray? that was, I had proof the block in black. So it was a stain on the block. So when I inked up the block and I had black there, um, uh -huh. that was literally just a stain because these are unsealed blocks. So I, I proofed this particular image um, in different colors for Lynn. And so at one point it was blue, at one point it's gray, at one point it's black. So the last time I proofed it, it was black. Um, and when I cleaned the block, there was just a, essentially the wood was stained that color. So that, that's what that was. So I was just rolling the new color right on top. Okay. And then from Deb Rosenbaum, she would like to know if you want to make the wood grain a bit less contrasty, would you lighten pressure or alter ink? Um, it kind of depends on what the artist is looking for. Um, sometimes I would actually fill the grain slightly um, in order to reduce the amount of it. And you have a variety of ways you can do it. it depends on how permanent somebody wants something. Um, I generally try not to increase the ink quantity to squish into the grain because you end up with a kind of too shiny or spotty of a surface. So usually if, it's, if somebody doesn't want so much grain, they just want a little bit less, I'll actually fill the grain slightly. Okay. And we could do, or I just change the veneer too. Like we could just use a, I just use a different type of wood, like ash or something like that. It has a much tighter grain with less. And this question from Sandra de Riker, can you give some examples of what you talked about and how that led on to these choices of material and process? Um, with lens work specifically? I think so. Yes. Um, well, part of it was uh, in looking at Lynn's drawings that she was doing, she had started doing this thing where she was painting or drawing on one side and then flipping the sheet over and working on it again. So because it was thin uh, graph paper, you could see through, but it was, it was kind of muted. And the way in which she was drawing were kind of these short hash marks. And, and I, I looked at it and I thought, uh, you know what, there maybe there's something for woodcut here to where you can get that movement of grain to give you some of that kind of feeling that you're trying, that you're working on in the drawings without necessarily drawing it. So it's a different way of approaching um, a material and the fact that Lynn hadn't done woodcuts before. So it's like, well, it's maybe if we go, we're in a totally new body of work, why don't we stay in that kind of new mindset instead of sometimes when you've done a lot of work. So Lynn's done a lot of intaglio prints. Um, and when you've done a lot of work in one process, sometimes that history creeps in in ways that, that are unexpected and may limit, potentially limit you even because of your familiarity with it. And in this case, since it was such a new body, we really talked about staying in this new and potentially uncomfortable space. So working in a completely new process for her. So it was really why we arrived at using woodcut um, as the process, as well as um, you got approaching it in the way we are. Cause I wanted Lynn to be able to see the most you know, and, and to keep it as fresh as possible. Because for me, like when I'm working with an artist, it's not just that we wanna make something, we wanna make something of value because it's in multiple. To me, that means so much more because what the artist has to say is likely to persist and is likely to spread because it is in multiple, it's on paper. It, it can be disseminated all over the world and it will have a much greater likelihood of it surviving. So for me, it's really important that when I'm working with an artist that we get to that place where they feel really confident in 
their voice and what it is that they have to say and communicate. And so I try to help them stay in that place as best as possible. And sometimes it's just by doing something out of your comfort zone that you can focus that easier. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Do we have any other questions? We can, I can show you stuff and we can talk about stuff all day long. But um, for me, what I think one of the things to really kind of bookend this with, you know, the book is that this way of working has been going on since, you know, the 1550s, you know, and we really haven't changed our process so much as far as how we think about collaboration or the value of prints. But when Bob Blackburn came along, it, one of the things that he's really instrumental in helping to change uh, is the perception of print in the world. And so most people want to think about printmaking, the average human being out there, they think of it as a largely reproductive thing or a recreation of the world, like our money, books, magazines, billboards, things like that, where you're, there's an idea that is set and you're just reproducing or recreating it exactly or as best as exact as you can. But there's also the other side of that where you can use the process to create a world. And Bob Blackman really, especially with his collaborations with Robert Rauschenberg, really demonstrated that out a great deal. And yes, I see somebody also with Will Barnett. So Bob worked with Will Barnett and they developed a, a wonderful style of working back and forth with one another at the Art Students League when um, Bob was a student. And it was really not, Will would always say this. He's like, Bob was my student for like six months. <laughs> and at that point, they were basically peers. Um, and so it, a lot of this philosophy of working towards creating a world versus recreating a world that was, it was wildly new in the late forties and early fifties. And then into the sixties and seventies of the printmaking Renaissance of the sixties and seventies that many are familiar with, but there was a, a very new idea that you, you didn't editioning became something you could do, you know, to reproduce it. it would be, a lot of artists started approaching the process of printmaking as a means of making their work because they wanted the feedback and the, that material literacy that comes with the processes is so wonderful. And so, but you could oftentimes have the choice of editioning at the end of your process. You could go back and you could put them together. But the idea, what we're talking about here about creating a world is, is about having a result you're looking for, but not necessarily knowing how you're gonna get there or what it's gonna look like. And, you know, and working with the prints I showed you with uh, Caitlin and Lynn, we have a goal in mind. We have, you know, something we're trying to achieve as far as what we want something to do in the world or what, how they want people to feel about it, how, how they want people to interact with the work but we don't know exactly what it's gonna look like. And so from that standpoint, we're trying to create a world. And so it's my job to help them gain as much control of the process as possible, as, and, but at the same time, opening them up in a way that helps them feel free to communicate and connect with their own work in a different way, to basically be a primary viewer of their own work. So it's one of the nice things about printmaking is that it's one of the few media an artist can work in where they are a primary viewer of their work just like everyone else. So an artist works on a block or on a plate, a set of blocks and plates. So, you know, you're working on the, on the wood, but what we're actually making is ink on paper. And so it's not until all these different blocks get printed together and that sheet is lifted from the press that you actually see the art. And you're seeing it for the first time, even though you've been doing all this work, you're seeing it for the first time just like everyone else. And that's a really rare and wonderful thing for an artist to get. You know, one of the things I talk a lot about in the book is the relationship between the artist, the printer and the publisher and the faith that's required that something good will come of it. It requires a great deal, especially from the publisher's perspective. So they have to put their money up front and say, we believe that all this time and effort and money we're spending will be worth it in the end with the work that results. And it, it requires a great deal. A gallery you as the artist have put up all that work and time and money and effort yourself and they get to see the finished product and decide if they're going to put it up or not. A print publisher, on the other hand, they have to vet the artists so much more. They have to have so much more faith in them because the work hasn't been created yet. And I think it's really important to highlight that. So when you're buying a print, what you're buying is an extraordinarily considered work of art that a great many people have been involved with and a great many people have great faith and belief that it is not only worth producing, but valuable culturally. And so I think it's just something to really highlight about prints that's a little bit different than other media, because you're getting that sort of consideration. 
We have some more questions in the meantime uh, from Eve Stockton. Can you talk about the work on the wall behind you, the two pieces there? Sure. Um, let's see, the one on the right is a finished painting of Kevin Hogan's, who is my studio host. So I'm in residence at the Hogan studio here in Asheville, where I saw the print shop. And so these, what you're seeing on the walls, and I'll show you some more, um, are some completed, some works in process paintings of his. So this is a studio that shifts around a lot. So um, depending on what he's working on or what I'm working on, um, you know, so you can see more stuff over there. Some stuff's packed up, some stuff's getting ready to go out. Um, everything's pretty much on wheels. So this is one of my tables that's on, I'm wheeling you guys around on it. So we can completely rearrange the studio based on process needs and studio needs at any given time. So yeah, Kevin is a, you know, longtime resident of Asheville, uh, well-known artist who uh, was very generous to create this residency for me to set up. Um, I had some other plans for setting up uh, workshop stuff pre-pandemic that obviously got changed. And so we're all trying to find our way forward, not just to be able to produce our work, but also to be able to you know, financially sustain ourselves through this time. So I'm very grateful to him for that. And, and it's nice to live with uh, working around good work at the same time. So. And from Deb Rosenbaum, will the current print be totally wood or will additional processes be added? I assume referring to Lynn. Um, right now, we're actually talking about adding a, what would we call a tone plate underneath uh, the central kind of cutout, like what we just printed in gray. Because um, what Lynn's been working on in her studio, and she might be able to show you one that she's hand colored, is, is, to, is to how to create a different quality of light to make it kind of feel like it emanates from within it. So we may be using, um, in this case, it's, it's a kind of akin to monotyping, but it's essentially a, a flat plate that would be inked um, to create this kind of haloing effect and to change the quality of light within the wood grain um, to make it float a little bit differently. You know, because one of the things that's really important to Lynn's work is it's not just, you know, obviously the formalist things like color and composition, but also that, uh, it behave in a way that um, creates a conversation between you and the work. It creates your place and its place. And sometimes it wants to pull you in or it wants to come out. And so what she's trying to help is there be a, a visual pull and shift of certain parts. So yeah, there will be another process that's added in. I can't say exactly how we're gonna do that yet. Um, we're working on that part. I'm gonna get the proofs back from Lynn here soon. And then we'll start talking about ideas about how to achieve some of those effects and how to push them a little bit more to maybe get a little bit more of that glow. Cause what we're really, I mean, right now it has a, a wonderful resonance, but what she's really talking about is how to create even a little bit more um, movement or floating almost just to kind of a feeling of light emanating from the work. So that's what we're gonna work towards. And then from Judy Minch, do you also mention that Will Barnett started the print shop with Bob? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, 1948, the. Will Barnett's the reason the printmaking workshop got started. And it had to do with the fact that Will was getting tired of sitting on Bob's bed, sponging a lithostone. Because, you know, some little known facts, as an African-American, once Bob was no longer allowed to be a student at the Art Students League um, and receive the scholarship, he lost the ability to continue to work there. And so he had a small litho press set up in his bedroom. And Will would come over and they would work. And so Will would be sitting on the bed, like sponging stone while Bob was printing. And Will's like, we got to change this situation, Bob. And so Will Barnett and uh, Richard Bronner, and there's another artist as well, helped raise some of the initial monies to open the, you know, to create the first space, which was a fourth floor walk up um, down on 17th Street, I believe. And yeah, so Will was really instrumental in helping begin the printmaking workshop. And it was a cooperative in 1948. It was, you know, a key holding kind of situation where, um, you know, everybody contributed what they could financially to cover the rent. You know, Bob had his bedroom in a room off in the corner and the rest was just all print shops. People would come at a wide variety of times during the day. And, um, you know, Bob was, Bob was always wide open to and letting anyone in. And it was just a lithography workshop back then. And it was in 1952 when Atelier 17 and you know, Hader moved back to France and that group of artists was really looking for a new home. It was in 1952 that they kind of merged those, what was left of Atelier 17 in New York City merged with the printmaking workshop. And that's when Intaglio came into um, the printmaking workshop at that time. 
um, there, there, the history and the number of people involved in keeping that going is, is, is phenomenal. I mean, it's such a, a rich time in American history where artists were really paving the way on how best to behave in society. You know, they were creating an oasis from the rest of the city. So predominantly the workshop at that time was servicing African-American artists, the Afro-Caribbean diaspora of artists, as well as expatriated Jewish artists from Europe uh, from the Second World War. These are people who are finding it difficult or impossible to work in other places in the city. And Bob's shop was always welcoming to everyone. He didn't care where you were from or um, you know, anything else other than the fact that you were an artist and you wanted to make work. He always used to say that an artist can always have a conversation with another artist, regardless of language The art speaks. And if you both know printmaking, you can have a little bit more detailed conversation. Yeah, so Will Barnett was really instrumental and he was somebody who I was uh, lucky enough to spend some time with before he passed um, and get a lot of that. Will was a very special guy. Well, we're, we need to wrap this up uh, fairly soon, but I have one last question from Catherine Blood. During your decades of work as an artist and collaborative and master printer, what have you seen among major changes and developments in the realm of printmaking? It's a big question. <laughs> That's a big one. Wow. That's a whole other Zoom conversation. A brief um, response. Um, I, I, I'm going to, I guess I'll go two short points. First is resilience of the medium. And I think it's resilient because it has a physical product. And that physicality is super important, especially in this digital era when things are not necessarily being updated to the new format. So how many of you have lost photographs because a hard drive crashed? Or how many of you have actually printed out email correspondence because we don't send each other letters anymore? So the physical aspect of printmaking um, has kind of almost created a second print renaissance uh, in this era because those are the things that will persist. That's how future generations will better understand who they are because they know who we were because we've left a record. So on one end, I found that instead of going away, like a lot of people predicted when digital print came in, they would just go away. Um, printmaking would fall by the wayside because you could just hit command P and out comes your print. It's actually caused people to want to go back to more traditional printmaking even more and to gain that, that touch sense, that, that material literacy. As far as processes are concerned, what's really wonderful is that printmaking is an additive technology. So our toolbox, we just keep throwing tools into it. So a new technology comes along, it's just added in. We don't get rid of anything. So a lot of what, I, you know, the screen print that I just did for Glenn Baldridge, that's using digital film as well as hand-drawn film, right? So, and it's, so I'm using very new technology with very old technology. I'm printing on a litho stone in here at the same time as I'm doing other digital related media or having stuff laser cut. And so for us, the, the wonderful aspect about printmaking is that additive toolbox. So the next thing that's coming online that we can possibly use, we'll take advantage of that when we have artists who are interested in trying something different. So I think, you know, the health of the field, we're in no lack of enthusiasm for artists wanting to do it and printers wanting to help them. The real problem comes into it's the, the financial feasibility of things. It's the cost of operating is so high now and the cost of materials are so high that that's the part that's the most difficult because the price of prints really hasn't changed all that much in a very long time. Uh, to give you an example, this is the example I use the most when I'm talking to collectors, is that uh, Jasper Johns' false start, which is you know one of the most famous prints, you know, it's considered by many historians to be a you know, first painterly print. It's not, to me, it's not the first painterly print, but it's the first one about painting. Um, sold for about $500 when it was released in 1962. An artist of similar stature to Jasper Johns, who, where he was at his career in 1962, which is an artist who'd sold very few works but had a lot of promise, um, that's what we can sell their prints for today. So to give you kind of an example, is that people really still keep thinking about print as having to be quote unquote cheap. And as a result, it makes it financially difficult to go down that road. And, and the worst part for me is it limits the voices who get to participate in the medium to those that just can have a higher return on the individual price point of the sale of the prints. And so for me, it's, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon us as a community of people interested in print to really think about how we move forward and how we support. And it's gonna, it's gonna require being willing to spend a little bit more. You know, and so that's really the, the, the worry that I see for the field is just, is actually that 
It's not anything else because, you know, artists are always going to want to make stuff. And people like myself will come along and want to help them do it. So hopefully that answers your question, Catherine, in a not too long-winded way. <laughs> so thanks for asking. What a fabulous answer, I have to say. This, you, you hit it right on the nose. Terrific. And I want to thank you and, of course, Lynn and Caitlin uh, for this fabulous presentation. It was unbelievable. And, and thank you, Lynn, for introducing us to Phil. <laughs> so special thanks to her. This is really one of the best programs I've heard yet. And I've been on plenty of Zoom programs. <laughs> so this is terrific. Thank you so much. And I have to tell you, all the comments are, have been superlative. Oh, I appreciate it. <laughs> I will, maybe you can see them. I don't know. I can see a few of them coming oh, through. And I, and, I, and I appreciate that. Accolades. <laughs> and, and I just want to say that, you know, I am always open to questions um, and part doing continued things like this. I do, I do a lot of events, especially for collectors as well as artists. I do tutorials and things like that. So if you guys need anything, you know, that's, that's what I do. I try oh, we'll to be back. It. Not to worry. We'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> and here, I'll screen share just real quick. Just like yeah. someone had asked earlier where um, they could uh, get the book. And yes. here you guys go. That's, um, that's where you can get it. And that's an Instagram if you want to follow along for things that are in process. Because I do um, put out regular photos, just not just of prints and stuff, but I also do a lot of art and things that might seem timely or things to remind people about, but also um, things that are in production in the studio and things like that. So, so if you're interested in just art in general, it might be something you would enjoy. And on here, it's got all my contact information and stuff too. So. Well, Catherine Blood has pre-ordered it already, just so you know. We get it soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so um, the pre-orders, you know, you can go ahead and order them. And even after, once it's officially out, you can still order them through me. Um, yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, so the two prints, there's the author's edition as well as, uh, so this is, um, let me see. I'll show you, I'll stop my screen share so you guys can. I'll pull this other one up so you guys can see uh, that print again, the one that I did with Glenn Baldridge, which is the artist edition one for the book. And Okay. So you can see this one, which is a lot of fun to make with him. And uh, we did, uh, Glenn Baldridge and artist Jakai Booker and I recently did a talk for the Friends of the Met um, and he's, both of them have had recently had their work on view at the Met because they're both, you know, in the collection there. And so it's, he's an artist I've known for a long time. It's been a lot of fun. And he was very generous with, uh, produce, you know, producing this with me for the book. So. Well, thank you so much, Phil. It was a pleasure thank you. Both. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Bye -bye. <laughs> thank you, Phil. Thank you for everyone for coming. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.